Uh, today we've got John Higgs. Uh, he's one of my favorite authors. He's written a bunch of books, both fiction and nonfiction. Uh, he's done works on counterculture icons such as Timothy Leary, uh, William Blake, the KLF, who we'll be talking about today. Um, he's also written a few books about kind of the history behind history, you might call it. Uh, just lots of esoteric things that you didn't learn in school that is absolutely fascinating. And he's got a book coming up uh, next year, I think, that is about Doctor Who called Exterminate, Regenerate the Story of Doctor Who. All of that together, basically, I feel like John is like my personal chef that writes things just for me because these are, <laughs> he just he just covers all the topics that I love. Um, so thanks for taking the time to talk to us, John. You're very welcome, Greg, and I am doing it just for you. That, that's the truth. <laughs> so um, to, what does Greg want next? <laughs> To keep things simple today, because John has written a lot about a lot of different things, uh, we're just going to talk about mostly the KLF book because I recently watched a documentary called Who Killed the KLF, which brought a lot of the book back and John actually appears in the documentary as well. It's a fascinating documentary, but also seems rather based on John's book. Well, I have to get it in focus here hmm. about the KLF. Get it. It's just an amazing read. Um, I think for a start, John, could you just, this is going to be tough, but could you just give a summary <laughs> for people as to who the KLF were? Uh, sure. Well, the KLF were a very successful uh, British band in the early 90s. They were the best-selling singles band in the entire world in 1991. Um, a lot of younger generations have never heard of them because when they split up, they kind of tried to delete themselves from music history. They sort of kept, they, they were independent, so they, they, they published all their own stuff, so they were able to delete their entire back catalogue, so their music's never used in adverts or films or video game soundtracks or, or anything like that. Um, and they did the most taboo act, which was they took the money that they'd earned, they'd earned a million pounds at that point, and they, they put it in a suitcase, and they flew up to the Hebrides, the Isles uh, of Scotland, and in a deserted boathouse in the middle of the night, and I think it was the 23rd of August, 1994, they found a fireplace and they put the money in the fireplace. And they just spent, I think it, was, it took about two hours just to burn it all. And they burned this, this million pounds. And when I heard of that at the time, it just... I just couldn't get my head around it. It was like my model of the world could not contain that act. Like I didn't understand the world enough to accept that they'd done this thing. Uh, and as a result, their story just stuck in my head. And for I think the next 17 years, it just wouldn't, wouldn't go away, wouldn't go away at all. And so uh, come I think it was about 12 years ago now. It was 2012. And it was that point when um, Kindles had just been invented and Amazon were allowing people to self-publish e-books for the first time. This was a new thing and it was a way to, uh, um, if you didn't have any connections in the publishing industry, it was able to sort of write something and get it out there so people could do it. And I thought, right, I'll write the book I want to write about this just to hopefully move on from it, you know, just to sort of be able to get past it and, and, and uh, process it the best I can and, and sort of move on. And so I wrote the book in a way that is uh, probably very different to pretty much any other music biography. If I'd been writing for a proper publisher, I would have shaped it into what those books are supposed to be. But because yeah. I wasn't, I just tried to explain it as, 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 as best I could. And, um, yeah, for all my hope that I would then move on from, from it, I've got it out. Here we are 12 years later, <laughs> sort of still talking about it. And it's a strange book. It just keeps going and it just sort of keeps going and it keeps getting passed from hand to hand and spreading around. I think it's coming out in America this year for the first time. And, uh, nice. the, you know, lots of things like that. The audio book will be out in America and uh, hopefully at other places other than Britain and um the 10th anniversary edition of it came out last year in hardback. So the book had gone from like self published ebook to paperback <laughs> to hardback. The whole that's thing, the wrong way utterly, around. it's totally <laughs> reversed. <laughs> of course, it is. But that's, that's the story of the KLF. You yeah, know, true. nothing is as it's supposed to be. 
Yeah. You know, no decision they made made sense in the, you know the the music industry terms, but they, they they were. But what they did was so fascinating, and such an insight into creativity uh, yeah. and what it means to be an artist and things like that. That it's a story that I think will just keep getting told and keep getting told and passed on. And hope so anyway. The funny thing is about the KLF. I feel like everyone knows the end story. Well. We mm. not not younger generations maybe, but everyone kind of ended up at the end story. But it's a lot of the early story that is almost more fascinating, um, especially with yeah. uh, for those that don't know. KLF is basically two individuals: Bill Drummond and Jimmy Cordy. Yeah. Um, and Bill Drummond in particular, like whenever I've read about him and read your book about it. I almost feel like he may be the most powerful occultist or magician of the past <laughs> century, but he didn't know it. And yeah. he's just walking around, make, you know, creating these rituals that are making all these changes in the world, bringing entities into the world. Yeah. Um, and that might seem weird to anyone who doesn't know the story, but it's just but crazy. It's not, at all, <laughs> not at all to people who know the story. They're just nodding along with you at that point. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, yeah. He's a fascinating individual because to look at him, you know, he might be an accountant or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of like the, as, as you mentioned, um, w when he painted up on the walls when he was working as the set designer, is it heroic? Mm -hmm. And it's like yeah. everything in his life was this heroic kind of thing. Absolutely. He's, he's kind of like this sort of dour, Scottish, uh, hard working Presbyterian. Um, he's, he's not a figure of joy, you know, he's, 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 he's a, he works, he gets the job done. He sees art as I must do the work, you know, that's, uh, uh, it, it's not an immediate, um, representation of like a trickster spirit or, or, or something more playful or something a bit more mischievous, but it is absolutely in there. And you were, you're quite right. It's, um, the thing about not knowing that you know he could be one of the most powerful occultists but not knowing there's um a thing that runs through everything he does is um to do with intent or, or to do with lack of intent it's not like you know ceremonial magic or something where there's a clear intent and you focus in the will and all that sort of stuff it's much more about honoring the initial impulse the initial idea uh and the initial idea is usually quite a fragile thing because you know your rational left brain self will then flare up and then just critique it out of existence and give you all these reasons why you shouldn't do these things and they're, they're stupid and you know he was he had this extraordinary ability just to um honor that spark honor that original sort of thing and, and sort of carry it through and hence they would produce work that um is so unique and so different to everything around them. I mean, before they called themselves the KLF, they were called the Justified Agents of Moo Moo, which is probably something we will get to. But I do remember hearing on the radio, this is by the Justified Agents of Moo Moo. And those words don't fit in <laughs> pop culture. It was an ancient, justified, words like that. You don't hear in the top 40, you know, in the, in the charts or something. It was coming from such a strange and, and different place. Um, and at the, the 10th anniversary edition of this book, I added a load of footnotes where I look back at the book after 10 years and try and sort of make sense of it. So I sort of critique myself as it goes along on this sort of weird meta uh, level. And I was aware in those footnotes that a lot of the conversation about the KLF has centered on magic. And, um, you know, the fact that the, in the subtitle of the book, Chaos, Magic and the Band Who Burned a Million Pounds, you know, it's, you know that's my fault. I've sort of, sort of pushed it <laughs> that way. But all their stuff is much more about um, transcendence. It's much, it's like searching for the white room. It's it's the last train to transcendental. It's like 3 a.m. eternal. It's just like, it's, um, it's going for something different than uh, controlling the physical world. It's... Um, yeah. They're, aim they're aiming higher than all that. Um, fascinating stuff, yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of, like, Bill Drummond, getting back to him, he just seems to, you know, he turns up, he's a set designer for Ken Campbell's 
play about Illuminatus and he's there with yeah. Bill Nye and all these people who have since become huge mm -hmm. names. Jim and then he gets in, then all of a sudden he becomes like the manager of, you know, Teardrop Explodes and, mm -hmm. you know, Echo, Echo and the, the Bunny, Bunny Man. Man. And then he's kind of out the door and then he's at the start of the, you know, the Ravier and Trance and then he's in the KLF. Yeah. And he just keeps popping up with these, you know, his own band even, you know, has mm -hmm. the guy from Frankie Goes to Hollywood and it's like just everywhere he went, it was just like, <laughs> he's, it's like he's weaving his own story through history that we're all just watching. Yeah, uh, he he um, he was in a very fertile place at a very fertile time, which was Liverpool in the late nineteen seventies. Uh, that sort of uh, punk era Liverpool was much. Um, it was very different to say London punk, which was very sort of nihilistic and um, you, you images of the Sex Pistols and gobbing on pensioners and green Mohicans or, or whatever. Um, how do you describe punk in Liverpool? It was, there was there was kind of like a ferocious level of ambition, but at the same time a refusal to take it seriously. Um, it was this, it was a huge exploring of uh, outpouring of energy. Um, it's like the band he was in, big in Japan, um, a sort of known now as a sort of a super group in reverse. Because it, it had, um, you know, Holly Johnson from Frank Gills to Hollywood. It had Bill Drummond from the KLF. It had Budgie on drums from Susie and the Banshees. It had Ian Drummond um, from the Lightning Seeds and all these sorts of things. All these people would go on and have, you know, scores of number one hits and be absolutely, absolutely massive. But there they were in this um, uh, punk band, which they all admit was just terrible. It was just, you know. None of none of them make a claim that what they had, musically what they put out um, was good, but it taught them um, the importance of the idea. That what it was, yeah. it was the idea was everything. The idea at the heart of it um, mattered most. Because if you if you you know make a song, say, and it's beautifully produced, and you know the, the singing's superb, and you know, but there's no idea there. It's just, it won't matter at all. It won't matter in the slightest. But if you have an idea and you make a version of the song that's a little bit shonky, the idea will shine through and it will still last and it will still sort of uh, register with people and it will still sort of matter. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, you know, as art schools are the usual place where people go and learn to, to yeah. be creative, but just down these back alley. And the fact that it was. Um, Matthew Street in Liverpool, where the cavern was, where the Beatles first emerged from. Um, uh, and it's all tied in with the dream of um, Carl Jung's, the most significant dream in his life, where um, the, the complete changed his life and led to a split from Jung and um, a split from Freud, sorry, um, where he dreamt he was in Liverpool with some friends and it was wet and it was damp and it was raining and all his Swiss friends were complaining about it. But he could see this, this, um, magnolia tree that was just illuminating the world and it was like it was lit up but the light was coming from it uh, and, and no one else could see it he was the only person he could see see this magnolia tree in his dream Carl Jung and he looked at it and it changed his life and, it, and, he, and he knew that there was something um, that mattered and it was fundamental and things like that uh, and he writes about this in his in his memoir um, and then various Liverpool poets tried to work out where in uh, a particular guy called uh, O'Halligan, he tried to work out what part of Liverpool matched the description Carl Jung gave the best. And he decided it was the end of Matthew Street, where there's a, um, where a bunch of streets all sort of, uh, sort of crisscross. So all these ideas started to sort of percolate ar around this, this, this area. And this is where Ken Campbell, the, the um, the radical theatre director came down and uh, set up the Liverpool School of, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, it's something like art, dream, music and pun. Uh, and in the, you know, in these strange back streets, he attempted to put on, and he'd successfully put on, um, a play based on Robert Anton Wilson's Illuminatus trilogy, this absolutely huge, epic, global spanning conspiracy thriller um <laughs> that is not the easiest thing to condense down into <laughs> no um, into, maybe for, for people who aren't familiar with robert anton wilson discordianism can we give a brief overview of how discordianism started how that evolved into the illuminatus 
trilogy. You didn't yeah. have to. You don't have to try and explain the plot of <laughs> Illuminatus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might take some time. This is this is the thing with the, the KLF, and and you look at their background and their mythos. There's um, all these interconnected um, strands and ideas and philosophies and, uh, and creative people, um, and the people in that world get all the references. It all makes sense and it all sort of ties up but when you come to it you know new you see this ever expanding mythos and it's bewildering and it's very hard to sort of get your head around but discordianism i think discordianism is, a, is very central to it's a very it's, important part of part of it um discordianism is well it was robert anton wilson and uh robert shea were the, the authors but they were using ideas uh, that came from kerry thornley and, and greg hill who were two americans in the 1950s who um came to the conclusion that all religions were essentially looking at the order in the world and going look at look at that look how beautiful that is look at all this order you know the, uh there must be something that must be like a god that's created all this order and as they saw it the truth was the world was essentially chaos you know a bubbling sort of seething sort of ball of chaos and, and we project our ideas of order onto it and the only real deity that sort of embraced what the world really was was eris the greek god of chaos and confusion so they set up this kind of it's kind of a spoof religion called discordianism except um i mean it's usually described as a as a, a real religion described disguised as a joke or a joke dis, disguised as a real religion and and once you're in there you know there's no difference between those those things they all they're all talking talking about the same thing um, and this led to uh, a thing called Operation Mindfuck in the 1970s, where um, Discordians were just trying to jolt people out of their normal way of thinking by uh, absurdity and, and, and mischief. And, uh, and you can draw a line between all that and the sort of, you know, uh, conspiracy-laden sort of almost post-truth a uh, miserable sort of grim world of conspiracies that we have now where... Um, yeah, I'd definitely like to cycle back to that it's yeah. later, probably. Um, oh, okay, sure. Yeah, we can, we can certainly get to that. Because you wrote a great article called Operation Mind Fix, and I'd like to discuss that more, but probably just so we don't lose people, let's just stick to <laughs> discordianism through to the KLF and we'll mm. work from there. Yeah, and so... To explain why I'm talking about all this, in, in this book, the Illuminatus Trilogy, there's an organization called the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo who are linked to the music industry and they represent the forces of chaos at work in the music industry. And that was the name that Bill Drummond and Jimmy Corti took on. They called themselves originally the Justified Ancients of Moo Moo. So they tied themselves into uh, all this mythology without really understanding it. You know, Bill hadn't quite read, he certainly hadn't read the entire book at that point. He just sort of read the, the bits he needed at the start to to the stage um, sets for the play and, and, and things like that. So again, it was that accidental sort of becoming part of something larger. And the thing, I mean, the thing with that KLF book, I was aware that, you know, countless journalists I'd interviewed Bill and Jimmy and, and asked why they'd burnt the money. And no one was any the wiser after all this. They weren't able to really explain it. Um, and I knew that when I was writing the book, there would be no point in sort of following, you know, that the proper route. Um, instead, it was sort of stepping backwards, as it, getting a sort of larger perspective and trying to see um, the story that the people who were part of it couldn't see. And and that was quite spooky for a lot of people. I know Alan Moore in particular, who figures heavily in, in the book, uh, he's got, I didn't know any of this sort of stuff. It's incredible. You know, it's uh, sort of a, 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 quite a shock to him. But, yeah, that concept of story um, that you kind of frame the book about, at least the early part, you talk about that a lot. Um, I want to just go into that a bit because I, I just actually wrote down some quotes from a few spots because I think mm. I feel like that's something that informs a, a lot of your thinking or books, maybe not just that one. Um, in that book, you said that 
The nature of it all made you wonder if there was such a thing as a story that no one knows they are in, least of all the main characters. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just a really good way of explaining it because everyone seemed <laughs> bewildered as to what was happening. And they all seemed to be in this amazing story where, you know, people just kept intersecting. Just, you know, sometimes you read a novel and mm. you keep going, it's kind of unrealistic that these people keep bumping into each other or this person affected that person. And yeah. the whole story from Discordianism right through to the KLF mm -hmm. is like this story that was meant to happen. <laughs> and at the end, <laughs> the money is burnt and they're all kind of bewildered. Um, <laughs> and then just by coincidence, I was reading uh, the write-up for your next book, which is about Doctor Who. And mm. the write-up for that um, notes that he's been a central part of culture for 60 years and has rewired the imagination of generations, yet no one person invented this strange character and no one person controls them. They emerged mm. from the space between many minds able to evolve and adapt. Yeah. So yeah, that's, what, of, that, that's what fascinates me particularly about the character. Most fictitious character, you know, if you think of, I don't know, uh, Harry Potter or Sherlock Holmes or, you know, they've got a creator behind them. There's, there's a... Um, there's a J.K. Rowling, Arthur Conan Doyle, and Ian Fleming who creates this this character. Doctor Who isn't like that. It's it's um, hundreds of people have like given part of themselves to this this idea, uh, and they've they it's 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 almost like a self willed character that sort of wanted to um, that that is able to adapt and change to survive far better than any other character that there's ever been it's like from an yeah. evolutionary point of view you know it's the peak it's extraordinary the way it sort of lives and it, it does demand a lot of a lot of people there's a lot of people give a large part of their lives to it so that it can thrive and survive and stuff like that i think even in the klf becker book doctor who turns up and he the, does the, the, <laughs> well, the, the question of <laughs> Um, you know, I'm not saying it's a living thing. I'm just saying very, if you try and work out what the difference between a living thing and Doctor Who is, you know, that's a tough question. That's a very sort of tough question to ask because <laughs> the way it changes and adapts and evolves and consumes and, and things like that, um, are all the definitions of life, you know? Yeah. So it's this, this, this I, I, I find that like a fascinating topic. I mean, we've discussed this before, I think, but, you know, Alan Moore's idea space, this yeah. whole men mental manifesting in the world. And one of my favorite quotes is from Terence McKenna, who talks about how we're humans are basically psychic extruders. Like we make things <laughs> manifest in the world from our minds. Um, yeah. Can you it talk a little bit about so, you, right. you can so You can certainly, if you take a look at the big picture of, you know, of, of history, it is, it is a case of us. Um, leaving the natural world and live, moving into a world that's from our imaginations that have created. You know, if you sort of look around you, everything around you, the table, the chairs, the desk, the technology, the language you're speaking, all these things were ideas in people's heads. And they've sort of come out into the world and we're living in this world built from our ideas. Um, and that's a mind blowing separates. thing that people don't really think about too much, I don't think. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're all brought up that everything in the head is not real and everything that you can yes. measure with science, everything you can measure, everything that you can knock on, that's the real, but everything yeah. that we can knock on was mm. first in someone's head and then that's, somehow that's came out. <laughs> and something that's in someone's head, uh, it's not physically real, but it's a, it's, it's a, a real idea. You know, it's a different type of real, but it is still a real idea. It's still a thing that exists in the universe. And if your version of the universe your, your mental model and uni universe doesn't include all these immaterial things, then you're not going to understand how things are and how things work. I'm, I'm always struck by, you know, if you go into the bookshops and you look at the history section, it's just books about power. You know, and the you know, it's military power and political power and symbolic power, like the monarchy and all this sort of stuff. Uh, and the, the implication is our story you know, the story that is us is one of power, right? And it's not, because none of us have power, none of us identify with power, and it's you know, completely meaningless. They're never about imagination. Uh, and it can seem that, um, you know, a film, a song, whatever, a story, is very trivial compared to great wars and, and, and things like that. 
but imagination and power work very differently and act very differently on very different time scales. But they're both equally uh, important and, and significant. And, you know, I, I view it like fire and water acting differently, very, very differently. But, you know, a tsunami and a forest fire are equally powerful and they equally have an impact on the, on, on the world. And if your version of history is just power and you're not including the imagination and you're not including, um, you know, our culture and, and things like that, you have a very, very incomplete vision of our selves of our of our story of, of what makes us who we are you need them both to, to 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 move forward so i tend to write a lot about that side of what's made us because it's it's kind of like an open goal you know there's so many um writers just ignoring all this wonderful fascinating stuff <laughs> And I just go, oh, well, I don't mind if I do. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> Help myself. <laughs> yeah. The, K, the KLF yeah. book was, um, I remember when I was writing it, I said to uh, a bunch of music writers that I know, music journalists, I said, I'm, I'm writing a book about the KLF. And they looked at me and they just went, why? You know, <laughs> why, would, why would you do that? You know? And immediately after I'd written the book, that's the response was suddenly, I don't know why I never thought of that. I should have done that. <laughs> it's clearly one of the best music stories from the, you know, the past however many decades. You know, it's 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 um it's clearly a great story. Um and it was so invisible to people. It was really odd. It's just I found that really strange. It'd been sitting there for seventeen years and uh, outside, you know, the fan community no other writer had come along and, and taken it on and tackled it. And it's like, for God's sake, it's, it's, you're not going to find a better story, you know. Like, like you said, though, a lot of it is if you don't know discordianism, you lose some of the threads. And if you don't mm. know this bit, then you lose some of the threads. I mean, the burning of the million pounds is probably worth a book on its own, just, yeah. just to explore what happened there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just some of those other concepts right through to, you know, the bunny the manifestations of the bunny, bunny that keep turning yeah. up that are, that are just weird. Johnny, um, Johnny Depp's got into the bunny man thing now. There's, um, he's producing a range of, I don't know, t-shirts and jewelry and stuff with this bunny man figure. And, um, there was some quote about how the bunny man had been in his dreams and also in his son's dreams. And they both <laughs> realized they'd both been dreaming about this, this bunny man. And, uh, and that's what sort of led to all that. And that fits so well into into all this mythology and, and things like that um yeah it's a great it's 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 powerful powerful imagery these dark sort of uh, um uh long-eared slightly sinister <laughs> giant rabbit sort of figures that yeah. do pop up in mythology and, and do cryptozoologists do know a lot of tales particularly from northern europe of these these giant rabbit sort of creatures um yeah people, i mean people, I, I, who I should, know, people who don't know the story won't know what the hell we're talking about no i mean I, 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 it's probably fair to say that the book really isn't about the klf at all you know I, I should i should be honest and say it's not really a book about the klf but there was all these ideas that i wanted to write about and a lot about robert anton wilson and his ideas and to turn it all that into a book though you kind of need uh you, you need something to hang it on and the burning of the million pounds was just the perfect um, event with which to explore all this sort of stuff and explore all those ideas. Yeah, I'll just quickly talk about that. Um, I think you really summed it up really nicely when you talked about you know people's reaction to it. Basically, the KLF wasted a million pounds when they did their film, The White Room, back before yeah. not many people really knew who they were while well, they weren't mm -hmm. the KLF at that stage. So they kind of wasted a million pounds and no one really cared. Yeah. But when they I, burnt it, that absolutely. was the problem. And absolutely. you wrote that line, this wasn't money being wasted, it was money being negated. And I think yeah. that just nailed it. Yeah, that's what's shocking to people. No one's shocked that, you know, Elton John squanders so many million pounds on flowers or something like that. There's the understanding that um, the money is just sloshing through the, um, you know, 
uh, to the economy as it's supposed to. It's it's uh, it's supposed to move. It's supposed to sort of slosh about and, and move things. And you know, Elton John, it's a terrible waste. But then he earned the money himself. Everyone's kind of all right about that, you know. But if he was to burn that money instead of spending it on flowers, people are just deep down appalled. It's just, as I say, it's taboo. It's just so so wrong. Um, and it is. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a whole uh, community of money burners that have sprung up in the aftermath of, of what the KLF did. Um, and they see burning money as the only sort of morally acceptable sacrifice that you, that, that you can make. Every culture has a form of sacrifice in it originally. Um, but, or every religion, sacrifice is, is, is an important sort of thing. But it's kind of... You know, if you were to go off and, you know, sacrifice a goat, it's not really fair on the goat, is it? <laughs> Burning money is the only thing that is sort of morally, you're not sort of harming others. You're just harming yourself. You're sort of giving with n absolutely no possibility of receiving anything back. It's pure forgiveness. It's pure surrender. It's, it's pure um, sacrifice. Um, so it's it's potent stuff. It's absolutely potent stuff. And um, when you hear about them burning the money, you get angry, really, because <laughs> it's like they had this money and they didn't want it. And at that point, you're thinking, well, I, I'd have it. They could, you know, they could give it to me. I'd have it. You know, they're never going to give it to you. That was never going to be be an option or you think well like they could have given it to charity or, or something like that we don't know how much they did give to charity they may have been given a lot to charity that's not that's not really sort of discussed um your brain goes into all these sort of um perspectives on why it's just wrong and it's really wrong because we've just lived in a culture where the goal is to accumulate money and that's you know that's so um deep in our thinking that to do the opposite of it is sh is really shocking it's really shocking yeah. um, kind of comes and, back and, to almost like that journey of uh, bill drummond that i was talking about it's just powerful occultist walking through history all these amazing things <laughs> happening where whatever he touches and then his final act is basically he kills the god of our co current culture you know he, yeah. he basically know. just <laughs> he, he shows that he has no power over him I know it was what I was talking about earlier, how he honors the initial impulse. It was almost like the dark extreme of that. You know, once they'd had the idea to burn the money um, and they went through with it. That's the extraordinary thing. You know, it's one thing to start burning a million pounds, but to finish is, is you know, it's is quite, it's quite another. It took them to a very sort of dark place, uh, but they were sort of, you know, burnt out and exhausted by years in the music industry and all the um uh the toll that takes on their their, their nervous systems and they, they were in utter uh, and it, uh, madness might be over egging it but they were tipping into a very strange and, and very dark place and yet they still and they felt the urge this, the only thing we can really say about it is the urge to do it was so great that they went through with it without knowing why, without being able to explain it, without having the reason, without having the one sentence to say, well, I have done this thing because of X, you know, they just knew, they just felt it and they just acted on those impulses. Mm. It's rare that people will do that to that extent without their... Especially, especially when the stakes are so high. <laughs> the stakes are so high. And you know, they had children, you know, if your parents once had a million pounds and then burnt it right and if you're like a teenager growing up knowing this about your dad you're going to be resentful of that aren't you you're not going to be happy about it you know it's just yeah it's it's uh it's it's i mean there's a lot of people can't believe it happened you know and a lot of people say oh it's not true and things like that and there's a, there's certainly um a lot of forensic evidence that they did it. I think the BBC made a documentary and they had the ashes analysed. Yes, it was a load of burnt money and all this sort of stuff. It, it clearly happened, but it was. it's more that the people who knew them talk about the extent to which they seemed haunted afterwards. That is mm. the most convincing thing to, to, to say, yeah, that definitely happened. I mean, it really, 
affected them and probably still yeah. does to this day i'm sure they'd say yeah have you spoken to them at all no no in fact i've kept my distance i've um you know as i, I, I we were saying earlier the um i wrote the book without interviewing them and without asking and at first it was just well i'll just get me thoughts down and then i'll approach them and, and speak to them but the more i got into um this larger story the more i realized that was not the right thing to do you know they were um they were a band who would just take huge chunks of abba records or beatles records this is in the early days of sampling and use them sort of how they however they wished you know it was about reclaiming all these things and they weren't about asking nicely and doing things properly and the more i was trying to capture that spirit the more it was oh, i just write it and not speak to them and, and and put it out you know um it wouldn't have worked for any other band story i think but it, <laughs> something about this it was the right thing to do yeah and yeah there's and they cultivated i think i think it's mentioned in the documentary perhaps but they cultivate that mythos of if you have that mystery it, that becomes part of the mythos itself you know i, I feel like in this mm. instagram generation that you know too much about bands or authors jk rowling um <laughs> yeah <laughs> whereas, whereas if you have a bit of mystery and a bit of mythos you this whole thing grows on its own and yeah, that kind of it, happened with the klf to a degree it does and it's sort of i mean the the making of that documentary is on such a similar um spirit i mean the, the director got sent to jail halfway through and you know the klf were trying to prevent it and, and and stop it and warning people off from talking to them and uh, uh there was you know there was lawyers it was there was it was a a lot of people contacted me after the klf block and said look i've got to make a film of this i've got to make a documentary and i would always say um well if you can get the rights to the music you know then sure we'll speak and i can option it to you but if i don't think you'll get the rights to the music so and 99 percent of the people would then go and go quiet and that'll be the last they ever heard of them but chris atkins the director of, of this thing was like oh we'll never get the music but i'll get a lot of um you know lawyers to look to look into uh fair use of of it and i can i can do it all that way and even though they didn't want him to do it he just had this this um he just kind of kind of like he needed to do it i think he'd done a lot of work for other people and it was like he needed this one for himself that's how he <laughs> described it and he just was it's ironic, plowing... it's ironic that they um there's this copyright dispute over the music not you know getting the rights to the music yeah and they basically yeah. used abba and things like that wholesale absolutely you know the, <laughs> one one of the names of the klf was copyright with the k copyright liberation front one of the explained names um they were not about um honoring other people's copyright and so when i think they the film was first screened in a an american film festival and like they were the festival was threatened with legal um, things for showing it for, because of the copyright. And it was like quite shocking this to the, the KLF fan audience that the KLF were now at that sort of stage where they were doing that. Um, Bill's manager, Callie, takes full responsibility for it. He says, no, it wasn't them, it was me. I had to do that. I have to, you know, it's my job to, to and, all, and all this sort of stuff. But once they'd seen the film, um, they just went, Oh, it's great! That. <laughs> they really liked it. <laughs> they were all supportive of it, and the director doesn't know how they saw it. That's the lovely thing. Somehow they got <laughs> hold of a copy, and he doesn't know how. Um, but the whole thing with him going to jail in the middle of it, and it, the, just the level of um, will needed on his part to to get it made, it was clear to me that oh yeah, this this is the guy who's who's doing the film of it. You know, it was yeah. it, it, it was he just had that spirit that matched them he did such a good job on it him. i felt like it's good I mean, isn't it yeah I, even the recreations where they're you know doing some of the music they've got the lookalikes and yeah. they, they have like an oberheimer 8 the ob8 and so i went oh props to them they even got the right keyboards so. yes yeah that's right and the um they had stand-ins being bill and jimmy and uh when they were filming the burning of the money um, I think they, they set fire to the, the chimney or something like that. But the stand-in for the bill was a fireman. 
in real life. <laughs> so he, he knew exactly what to do and so on. <laughs> so, yeah. so, of course, of course, fire figures heavily in all this. The first KLF record was called Burn the Bastards. And so for it, the KLF story to end where it did with this, this, this bonfire, it's so, it's so apt. Everything's so apt on so many levels. The synchronicities pile so high with that sort of story. Oh, it's, it's hard to keep up with. Yeah. And you know, you've talked about, um, I'm just trying to figure out this way of saying this. You talked about Discordianism. Um, and basically, in Discordianism, it's a lot about um, people not attaching themselves to a belief and you know, being a lot yeah. more agnostic to try and what's the saying is not to be more right, but to be less wrong. Yeah. Um, but then the danger in that is becoming unmoored a little bit. You know, yeah. what, what Robert Anton Wilson called chapel perilous. You go Absolutely. to this place and you can really become quite unmoored for various reasons. And, you know, how much do you think the KLF kind of got a bit unmoored at the end? To a large degree, certainly to at the end, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. If you read interviews with them at that point, the journalists are like a little scared. They're they're they're, cer they're certainly terrified. Um, I mean, you see the live performance with the the shooting out into the audience, shooting blanks, but it's yeah. st it's still very off putting. Well, the original idea for that, with this, you're talking about the Brits Award, you know, big glitzy yeah. British music industry thing, which because they sold so many records, they were supposed to open, and you know, they, they decided to do it with extreme noise terror, which was which like that grindcore type music was um, not the not it was it was pretty much unknown to the mainstream audience at that sort of point. It was only real hardcore fans who are familiar with that. It, uh, who, who understood that, you know, it wasn't just noise. For most people, it was just noise. But their idea was to um, uh, chop off Bill's hand and throw it into the audience. Uh, and he saw all these echoes of the, the, the myth of the Red Hand of Ulster, which is tied into the area of Scotland that he sort of grew up in. And, and all the, he could see all the reasons for doing that. And um, it's very, they were just at that point where, it's, it's the, they sort of understood each other. They never argued. They got the point of what the other one was trying to do sort of creatively. Um, and that it sort of escalated them and escalated them. And it, it pushed them to the sort of the greatest achievements and some of the most brilliant stuff they did. But it could all, at that point, it was pushing them into like just, just a horrible dark sort of place. And thankfully they never did it. Um, but the fact that they were considering it, you know, is is telling uh, and and then they were like well i know what we'll do uh, we'll get a, a, a sheep and we'll dismember the sheep live on stage as we're playing and the act will be so appalling we'll never be forgiven for it right that was what they were planning to do but it just so happened that extreme noise terror were hardcore vegans and, and animal right activists and they were not having it and they have <laughs> got that one down <laughs> yeah yeah. I've um, completely forgotten what the question was, but there's, there's met so no, many, no, 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 so yeah. many tangents to go down down with all this sort yeah, of stuff. Just, just the way they become unmoored. Uh, we were just discussing that, but the other part of you know, returning back to what you were talking about earlier, um, another part of Discordianism was the Operation Mindfuck, and yeah. you know, for most of our lives, we would probably be right in on that. You know, it's mm. just this pr pranking and upsetting people out of their normal routines and waking people up, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then around 2014, 2015, yeah. Operation right Mindfuck got hold of it. <laughs> gets co-opted by the alt-right. Yeah. And all of a sudden uh, it all goes wrong, basically. All this um, is not so funny, is it? <laughs> no. Yeah. And it's, where does that leave us with that kind of idea of, Using it, Operation Mindfuck, it's it's almost like my, Operation Mindfuck was um, a prediction of the sort of world we were heading into, the more information rich um, world we couldn't really trust who was using it or to use these things against you, uh, and the whole it's pushed the whole. You know, I remember conspiracies in the nineteen seventies, and they were like they were about the, um, they were about faking the moon landings. They were about you know the 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 um, the lines in Peru being seen by aliens. They were uh, 
Bermuda Triangle. They were they, they were things that were um, mind expanding, and uh, um, fun's probably not the word, but they were they were um, exciting and sort of thrilling and, um, not and too made dangerous, the world though. made you, the world a sort of like... bigger place. No, absolutely. Now conspiracies have just fallen into this dark so it's just paranoia it's just the belief that them there's a them and they're malevolent and they're doing it and they're out to get you right um and it doesn't matter what that is that's always a little bit sort of vague but it's it's that it's that paranoid sort of school of conspiracy theories that's all been sort of pushed into and it's just miserable and it's just you know it's no fun and there's no, nothing enhancing your life or expanding it with, with these sort of uh, levels of um, thinking and there's you know algorithms are pushing people more and more in towards these sort of sort of dark paranoid places but I always see Robert Anton Wilson's writing um, as vitally important as almost like providing the antibodies for it it's like he was talking about all this stuff but also explaining um, how to survive it, um, particularly with the the notion of multiple model ag uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, mul multiple model agnosticism. That was a word I was stumbling over, uh, which is um, very agnostic about the different models used to understand the world, but uh, and you're willing to sort of switch between them. Um, I'm explaining this terribly, but the the main uh, takeaway was it's a way of not falling for your own bs for your own belief system for your own bullshit it's not it's not um you know it, that's what saves you that's what stops you from going down into these these really dark rabbit holes um the ability to not take the things you're thinking as gospel truth from every angle from every perspective um you know that they're just useful models from a certain angle uh, and if they work well, you, you keep using them. And if they don't quite fit, then you need to find another one. You do not sort of um, nail your colours to any particular worldview um, for long. They're all useful. We all need them. But they're all, so they're all models. And the model is, um, by definition, you know, a smaller and less detailed thing of the thing that it represents. It's not a one-to-one -one match. It's, there's going to be bits where it doesn't quite fit, where it doesn't quite work. And, you, and you, if you, um, if your identity becomes merged with like supporting a particular model, um, when you hit those things where it sort of differs, I, you'll probably just ignore it. You'll probably just blank it out as best you can. Um, but if you can't do that, then you sort of you sort of start to fight against like the alternative views and you and you you're um and you it's this fundamentalism where you dig in to sort of defend this abstract model and because that's you because it's it's you know your self-worth yeah. is bound up in that reading in an article you wrote called operation mind fix you actually sort of talk about how right-wing people arguing on twitter going mm. in to argue with them is the worst possible thing you can do because you know they're, they're stuck in chapel perilous and all of a sudden yeah. You're attacking their ideas, and they just can defend them. Then they can't. They're not going to sit there and consider their ideas. They're just going to defend them. Yeah, absolutely. Chapel perilous is a really useful idea. It's that um, it's a, it's a mental state. It's that point where you just you just your your maps run out when nothing really makes sense. It's when it's it's when you're uh, when you lose your religion. You know, it's when it's 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 when you don't have a way of grasping what the world is. Um, and that might explain a lot of, you know, the modern world could be causing that for a lot of people at the moment. It is causing it for a lot of people. And uh, Robert Anton Wilson said there's only really two ways out. Um, one was paranoia. And that's what's where most people sort of get sucked into, where they sort of cling to um, increase. The only explanation of why things are bad is because these malevolent others are deliberately doing it you know that's the easiest way to think about it it's like well i'm not sure about this but i'll blame them you know i'll blame them or agnosticism or the multiple model agnosticism that I've, we've been talking about where ideas are things to be entertained and, and tried and assessed uh and enjoyed and used and things like that but they're not things to um 
to take your identity over. You know, you, you're free yeah. to sort of step away from them to, to a certain extent. And I think when you're trying all those models, I think a key thing is to judge it based on it. Is it doing good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of toxic things that if people just step back for a second and asked, is this doing good? They would very quickly become agnostic about it. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Is it useful? You know, is it, is it, I remember Alan Moore, um, when he turned into a musician, um, a magician at the age of 40, when he announced he was going to become a magician and he thought, well, you know, maybe I've gone mad, right? If I'm a grown adult saying I'm going to be a magician, there's, there's every chance <laughs> that I've got, I've gone mad. How do I assess whether this is a good, good idea or not? And he said, uh, it's, it wouldn't be enough to, that, he was happy, right? Because he could be, you know, locked up in a padded cell, moon, painting his shit on the walls and perfectly happy. Yeah. <laughs> what mattered to him was whether he was productive and whether he was producing work that was as good as it should be, you know, whether his writing was as good as it should be. So that was his sort of, um, uh, the thing that he, he judged this new worldview, this magical worldview that he, he took on against. Um, and I think, yeah, he, he totally gets it from that. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's kind of cycling back a little bit there in terms of he became a magician, I think, because he started thinking of these ideas of idea space, of there being like a mental world that we could all participate in yeah. as, as a group, not just alone, a little bit like Jung's you know, archetypes, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think, it, again, that informs a bit of your work. Yeah, let me see what to what to say about the the collected unconscious and um, anything in particular about about all that sort of that sort of work. Again, it, it, what it, we were talking about with with Doctor Who and the stories and characters almost taking on a life of their own. I just find that a fascinating thing. Uh, we wrote an article on the Grail about how people <laughs> fiction writers have actually had people from their fiction kind of turn up in real life. I and know. I find yeah. it interesting how <laughs> that, that is, that is wonderful. One thing, one thing that's really, I've been, um, I don't know if struggling with is the right word about this, right. I'm writing this book about Dr. Who I talked a little bit earlier about how, uh, it does seem to act like a living thing, but you wouldn't want to class it as a living thing. Cause it's not a material thing. You expect these things. And the way that ideas sort of evolve and change and become more complex and become more um, evolved. in the same way that matter, when matter becomes more complex, it can turn into life. And when life becomes more complex, it can turn into consciousness. You know, this this sort of thing. I, well, I mean, ideas become richer and thicker and and um, and more complex. They do take on a there's a sort of phase change and they sort of behave differently. Uh, this is also, that's one of the reasons why I find Doctor Who so interesting because it's the largest of the sort of modern sort of British cultural ideas. We've had 60 years of stories, but on TV, but there's thousands more on audio and comics and books. And, and, it's, and if you get into the world of fan fiction, it's just utterly <laughs> uncountable. The amount of stories about this one character becomes richer. It becomes, um, uh, more real to people. It's uh, it's almost like a story generating machine, and I, I've sort of struggled with um, the extent to what's the difference between Doctor Who and re religion, um, because you know it's this idea of this figure who sort of comes from the heavens and in human form, and he to save us, and he, he you know, shows us morally, you know, how to behave and, and what's right, and how we should how we should do that. Um, uh, and it becomes stories that are passed down through families that are shared and they're sort of intergenerational touchstones where the parents who grew up with Tom Baker will sit down and show their kids, you know, David Tennant, and then they'll grow <laughs> up. And, and it becomes this multi-generational thing that, that's, that's uh, of value because it's, it's these stories that we sort of, that, that keep us together and bind us together. And the, yeah. the, it's like the, the new, new, it's the new mythologies, basically. Uh, you know, it, our mutual it, friend, it, Kat Vincent has written about uh, hyper real religions and yes. all of that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He's, he's and the, great. And the doctor is really stuff. like one of those characters. But around it, there's almost like a priestly cast. There's, 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 there's people who sort of work around Doctor Who, whose lives are sort of, 
uh, not guarding it, but sort of, you know, protecting it and keeping it sort, sort of going. And, and then there's a congregation, which are just people who turn up and watch on a Saturday. And that's the normal sort of congregation. But, but you can get absorbed into this higher sort of um, uh, group of people who, whose lives are Doctor Who, you know, who, who do the, the audios, the magazines, the books. The, and then above all that, there's the... Uh, the, uh, the the Pope, which is uh, currently Russell T Davis, the, uh, the the Doctor's representation on Earth, who is able to say what is canon and what is not canon, all that all that sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> that analogy. It's 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 so close, and there's no um, claiming that it's uh, you know that it's a great truth, and people who like other things have to be fought or anything like that. But I kind of think that's in its favour, you know. <laughs> that, that's a good thing, uh, and. The way it, it creates the conditions needed for its survival is really advanced on an evolutionary level. I talk in, in the book, I'm writing a bit about niche creation, which is this, this, um, this concept uh, from you know, environmental biology. And the idea is it's not that there's a, you know, a world full of like lots of food and, and nutrient and everything that something needs and a species just moves there and everything's right for it. It's a, a species just sort of acting in the in the uh, environment is what creates the conditions necessary for its survival. I see. I see. Um, you know, in my own career, that's the, that model holds. It wasn't that the world wanted like John Higgs books, right? <laughs> that they're waiting for that. I had to go and act in the world and sort of create the people who would who then want the books, and that's that's how how it works. And the way that Doctor Who creates the writers and actors who then go on to make it. I talk, I think I mentioned that in the KLF book. Um, you know, a lot of the, you know, David Tennant, Peter Capaldi, John, uh, Stephen Moffat, Chris Chibnall, Russell T. Davis, they all talk about it was Doctor Who that made them become sort of creative things. And it, it makes you become a writer. Like I said, there's a cliffhanger and you want to know what happens next. So you sort of imagine what's going to happen next. And that's turning so it's into kind of, a it's writer. Creating its own. <laughs> it's creating its own thing. But even to a more extreme extent, it's created the, t the company that makes it, which is a company called Bad Wolf. And I don't know how much you know of, of Doctor Who, but the idea of Bad Wolf in the original um, Christopher Eccleston series, it was... Um, well, it was this futuristic, it was a futuristic TV company and uh, the character of Rose sort of took the name and s spread it throughout time, uh, time. So it sort of self-created, it sort of created itself uh, in this sort of paradoxical loop. And then the people who made that then left the BBC and they set up a company to make um, his dark materials and a bunch of other great stuff. And they called themselves Bad Wolf. So Bad Wolf was... Um, a t became a TV company, which then took on Doctor Who from the BBC and now sort of runs and owns Doctor <laughs> Who. Meta. So it's so meta, it's so <laughs> convoluted. And, you know, it's the, 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 the fictional TV series invented the idea of this future um, TV company which came to exist, which then came to continue Doctor Who. Doctor Who sort of created everything it needs to sort of survive and exist. Evolutionary speaking, this is advanced stuff. If it wasn't for the fact that it's all immaterial, you know, that, that we're talking about yeah. ideas doing all this, you would absolutely see it in terms of a living thing and, 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 and things like that. It's... it's um, I love yeah. the idea of how it's basically created its own writers so that it can be... You know, in the future, it can keep developing itself. Yeah, I know. It's 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 worth thinking about, isn't it? It's worth sort of studying. It does it does challenge your basic assumptions of um, well, how the world works. You know, if ideas can sort of uh, have in in terms of evolution, there's no goal. You know, there's no uh, agenda. You know, it's just a fit. You know, it's, it's it's very dangerous if you start to talk about things becoming. Um, uh, the best or, you know, the survival of the fittest or all this. It's just what works. It's just there's no sense of it's got a goal or agenda. And, and the ideas are behaving like that as well. But it's very easy to project onto them a sense of agency and a sense of uh, purpose, you know, because um, when an idea can adapt as well as Doctor Who to the changing uh, culture and the changing... Uh, um, 
It's feels no, uncanny. I'm, it I'm feels starting. strange and uncanny. And yeah, it's a fact. I, that- I'm starting to because I grew up with Doctor Who's, and I think it informed a lot of because I grew up in like the John Pertwee, Tom Baker era. Yeah, and there was a lot of occult stuff there. Yeah, and now I'm starting to question because. Here I am, I've gone down my path, and now I'm running the Daily Grail. And all of a sudden, I'm talking to you about Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. And just help keeping it alive and helps all the people yeah. in support. And the fact that the new series um, with Shooty Gatwa on Disney Plus going to be all around the world, uh, Builders Series 1, you know, it's a brand new start. It's so contemporary. You know, there's a, there's a, a queer Rwandan immigrant in the heart of this British cultural thing. It's beautiful it's perfect it's the start and it's and it's 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 so uh tuned in to sort of gen z culture and things like that and yet it's the 60 years of it before this you know for a, an old tradition to be so apt for now is extraordinary yeah. you know it's yeah. really extraordinary. like you said it, it's evolved you know yeah absolutely and if we could evolve as well as that <laughs> we'd be much better <laughs> What inspired you to write the book? Like, was it some some moment where you went, I need to write about this? You know, it was, um, I wanted to write about mystery. I got, I got um, kind of fascinated to the extent that we're drawn to mystery, to, to the, the seductive appeal of mystery. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed to be at the heart of um, pretty much everything, really. The, uh, you know, the... The, the early explorers wanted to know what was over the horizon. So they'd set off in the boats to find out what was over the horizon. What is it? We need to know what that is. Or archaeologists wanting to know what our past was. Where digging in the ground, trying to find, you know, a city. Oh, it's Troy. That's sort of our, our understood past was that, that need to know, was to solve the mystery, to sort of keep going. The um, science is the same thing. And, and religion is the same thing. It's, it's to understand the mystery. So that, that drives us. Uh, and in context of of, of that, the, the idea that like the best-selling novelist in all of history is Agatha Christie makes total sense because there's something about mystery that um, it's. I, I, I was trying to find you know some nice good uh, neuroscience behind it, or some nice good science explaining why we need to know because animals don't need to know. You know, animals mm. are quite happy with how things are, but that, that need to know what we don't know. Obviously, it drives all the occult sort of studies, you know, as, as, uh, as, as well as other things. It did seem to be at the heart of everything that led to our current civilization. It did seem, if, it, if we weren't, if we didn't care, you know, what it was that we didn't know, we would just be happily knocking around in our caves, having a good time with them. Uh, as we used to, but it sort of dread. It struck me that mystery was much more important than we give it credit, and um, I couldn't find anyone to tell me why we behaved that way. So I thought this is all really interesting, um, and I wanted to write a book about mystery. But the um, nobody is really looking for a book about mystery. <laughs> I think is you get you get all these ideas, and then yes, you, you want it to sort of put them on a story that people will identify with and want to read, you know. And it struck me that it's going to be Doctor Who, isn't it? I'll just I'll write a book about Doctor Who and I'll be able to put those ideas in. And they're only kind of a small part of it, really. There's, you know, there's, it's much more about all the, the hundreds of different people who, who came together and gave part of their lives to this character to, to make them become what it is. That's really what the story is. But you're able to put in a lot of that stuff about what drives about mystery. And, uh, okay. We've got the script then. Words. Isn't it really about yeah. Doctor Who? It's a yeah, subversive I know. book. Absolutely. <laughs> you just it's, if you, you, having something to write about and having a, a way to do it are often t- you need both. Basically, you sort of you sort of need both. Yeah, it's a good way to get people thinking too. Uh, it was, it's also it's also the, part my fault in that my last book was about James Bond and the Beatles. And my publisher was like, oh, great, this is, people, we can sell <laughs> this. People will know what this is and people will buy it. And so when you go, I want to do a book about mystery, they're like, yeah, so how could you do that in a way that people would buy it? <laughs> so, so it's a fair question. It's a fair question. There was a quote from Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails that I've always thought about uh, back in the early 90s where someone said, why the hell did you make a pop song Yeah, uh, when he did Closer to You? 
And he said, because it's the most subversive thing you could do, <laughs> basically. You can, you can bury things in it. You can hook people in. Yeah. And they don't know that you're doing it. You know, it's it's this thing that just grabs their attention. Yeah, so uh, it is. That's what you're doing. If you have a little <laughs> sort of subversive or radical idea, you don't put it up in front and center because it'll it'll only appeal to people who who already thinking along the same ways. You write about something completely inconsequential or different, or you know, and you just slip it in there, and it's just. Which is a little bit like the the KLF film, because even the KLF themselves, you know, they're just massive pop songs. They they Mm -hmm. kind of talk about it being a joke, but, I mean, those songs were bangers. (laughs) Yeah, they really were. I think Um, that is the important thing. And then here um, we are talking about discordianism, things like that, after getting hooked (laughs) on those pop songs. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, In terms of the Doctor Who book, what can people expect apart from it being subversively and hiding things inside? <laughs> um, <laughs> is it basically like going to cover the whole history or is it yeah, con- it's, you know, it's centering the, it's, on one particular it's the, thing? It's the last 60 years. It is the story of Doctor Who. People think after I did the Bond and Beatles, I'd have some sort of twist. But the story of it is, you know, utterly fascinating. Uh, and um, the people involved are utterly fascinating. Um, mm. And it's kind of been... Not in fandom, but it's kind of been overlooked outside of the fandom world because it's Doctor Who. It's like this kid's thing. There's Daleks, there's Cybermen. It's it's silly. Um, You know, there was a a great sense. It's changing a bit now, but, you know, fantastic sort of ideas, heroes, monsters and stuff were not uh, suitable for a sort of adult unless they were like um, the Greek myths. Or, or, or enough time had passed that academia could sort of deem them sort of worthy for adults to pay attention to something. The fact that it was happening now and that like people got it without the need of academia, it was sort of kind of shunned and stuff like that. So it's an extraordinary story. There's a, um, obviously in the fandom world, there's thousands of books about every minute sort of detail and uh, the pretty much every, the amount of biographies and autobiographies I've been reading to sort of find the sort of stuff is, is it's a phenomenal sort of thing. But I'm sort of hoping that while this will work for diehard fans, it will be people who've never bought a book about Doctor Who before um, will hopefully trust me enough that, like, no, this is a story that you you should read this. You really should. This is, this is interesting stuff. This is great. So hopefully... Um, yeah, if it, if it can appeal to the sort of fan curious, you know, the people who haven't quite gone down the road to sort of identify as being a, a fan of these things because they're a little bit, they don't really want to go that far into it, but they're, they're drawn to it still. You know, there's a little bit of them that register, that recognises there's some magic there and that it maybe as a child it mattered to them and that part of them that's still that inner child, you know, still there and it's still important it still matters and then slightly drawn to, to the thought of Doctor Who um, without wanting to go into the sort of world of fandom which can be quite toxic and which can be um, <laughs> yeah. can be quite yeah, messy sure. in, in many ways hopefully that's that's the people yeah. that will reach well just as long as you write about all the occult things in early 70s Doctor Who then I'll be happy <laughs> otherwise I'll get toxic with it <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I love that. I love that whole section. I should, I should, just I'll, they, I'll, I'll, the writing seemed to just go down like an occult beat for a while. Yeah. There's a, I'll have to stick in a, a chapter about the Damons um, just for you, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to read it. Seriously, I like. I loved all your books. Like I said at the start, that wasn't disingenuous. Everybody watching this, you should read all of John's books. They're just fascinating, every single one of them. And oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Do- Doctor Who is what I grew up on. Uh, mm. Like in, It informs so much of me as, as a youth. Um, Tom Baker is, feels like this distant uncle that, <laughs> that yeah. you know, is still around. Um, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to the new book. Thanks for taking some time today, John. Uh, we'll have to catch up and talk about some of your other books. It's been, we didn't it's even been... fit KLF stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> it's been lovely, Greg. It's it's been met too long since we last talked, and we should do it a bit yeah, more often. We should do it a lot more often. We, we have yeah. we have the technology to do it, and yet we keep forgetting yeah. to do it. So yeah, we must absolutely. do it more in future. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thanks, John.